So I'm talking to the cardiology group. I'm trying to touch on a few things that impact cardiology. And, and uh, I think some of our newer devices particularly are, will. Uh, well, let's see, how do you advance this thing? Here we are. Here we, of course, we have to go a little bit to the history. And it, it is uh, important to recognize, as I've gotten older, to recognize Dr. <laughs> DeBakey's contribution. He looked, we used to think he looked a little bit like the comedian Groucho Marx, and he does actually. But he wasn't funny, let me tell you. He, he's the toughest guy I've ever been around. But as I've got, grown older, I've understood he, uh, he had to build a lot of things and he, he didn't want to waste time doing it. This was uh, the medical center when he came here. Dr. Vakey told me all these were restaurants and things like that here. And uh, you had this sort of back road in here. And Dr. DeBakey told me he heard a gunshot wound, gunshot going off. And, and when he first came here, this was 1948. And they were actually hunting deer out there in the medical center, in all these woods. Anyway. My major goal now, as far as my research work is concerned, is to protect the artificial heart. When I started, this was one of his, his big deals. He was going to make an artificial heart. And the, the, uh, he had to get funding for it. You know, the government doesn't do anything. The government sends out RFPs, requests for proposals. For example, you know what the B-17 was a bomber that destroyed Europe and got about 60,000 American boys killed also. You know what the B stood for? Anybody? No. Bomber, it sounded like it would be a bomber, but it didn't, it stood for Boeing because Boeing won the contract to, to build over uh, McDonnell Douglas. The, the thing that helped a lot in the field, and basically the whole field came from here, Houston, uh, except for the words that the guys did in Utah, but that sort of reached a dead end. Um, the, uh, the, this is, and DeBakey was behind this. They had a meeting up there in 63 to push the development of the total heart. We were already planning on going to the moon, and this seemed sort of a sideshow to that. What are you doing? This is, I gotta just hide this. Hmm? There you go. Oh, God. Well, anyway, if you had the next slide, it would show Dr. DeBakey with his hands in LBJ's pocket, getting the money to start the whole research field. And that was important because, as I said, you had to have uh, the, uh, the funding to do this research. And, and uh, it certainly wasn't a field that the private companies uh, could be involved in. It's important also to remember that transplantation was just out of the, anybody's brain at that time. That was just too far-fetched to even consider a possibility. Shumway was the only one that was really working on, on heart transplants, and he was sort of by himself in, in Minneapolis and California. Domingo Leoto was an Argentinian uh, engineer, doctor who started working on the artificial heart in Argentina. He presented his work at Asayo in 1961. Dr. Vecchi happened to be there and he recruited him to come to, to Houston to work on these things. Here's, here's uh, LBJ, the patron saint of Texas. And Dr. Vecchi, 
You know, we always thought Dr. Vakey was sort of a mutant of some sort. Because, you know, most people's forehead starts here, like, oh, you've been LBJ, it goes straight up. But not Dr. DeVakey. It goes at a 45 degree angle here. We all, when I was a medical student, we said there was a product of an alien visitation to Lake Charles, Louisiana in uh, 1908. But let me tell you, he was a smart guy. He was very brainy. He was fortunate he had two sisters that looked exactly like him, exactly <laughs> like him. And they were just as smart as he was. Lois DeBakey, I think, was smarter in some way. And they wrote all his papers. Dr. DeBakey one time told me, he said, never trust a surgeon that's writing a lot of papers. Well, he had like 700 papers, but he didn't write them. His sisters wrote them. And uh, I just uh, don't know what his whole uh, career would have been without him, and I'm sure he appreciated that himself. But uh, Lois DeBakey founded the American Medical Writers Association, and she was its first president. And she was smart, and she was mean, too. He didn't want to cross her. Anyway, this was a lot of money in 1965. And this was uh, a 1965 time. Here's DeBakey again, he's on the front page of Time. He was very controversial because he was the first doctor to sort of get into the public eye and also to get money from the government. And he was very smart in doing that. And this was in that uh, journal, somebody, I have a journal and somebody popped it, but uh, this, this is a slide from that Time magazine. These are the new hearts that they were working on with Domingo Leotis. It looks like something uh, out of your high school uh, science project, you know, you made in your garage. But they nearly were made in the garage because Domingo Leota was just making these things up in, up in the lab. And uh, none of them worked very well. This was the medical center when I started. And uh, we had to, I can't, I can't make this thing work. Anyway, what's wrong with this thing? Joe, this worked before you got a hold of it. Anyway, here's where we parked. This is the medical student parking. Had to walk all the way over here. Of course, this is all the University of Texas now. I think the medical students park in Fort Bend County somewhere now, I don't know. Anyway, if you could hear Dr. Beggy, you would say the heart was just a pump. And it seemed simple enough to make a pump, and it was. It was simple to make a pump, but it wasn't simple to make one that would last year in and year out, beating 100,000 times every 24 hours, if you do nothing. And uh, it's quite a remarkable organ. Now, Dr. Cooley came here uh, shortly after Dr. Bakey. Dr. Bakey came in January of 1949. Dr. Cooley came in uh, 1951. He'd been with Blaylock, and that was very important because Texas Children's and St. Luke's were one hospital at that time. You couldn't fund a children's hospital, so they had the idea that the Episcopalians, that always were long on cash, could fund the children's hospital, and, th and that actually worked for a number of years. But the main thing for us, and for me, and for you, actually, was it resulted in Dr. Cooley having privileges at St. Luke's. All the other surgeons were Methodists and under more or less Dr. DeVakey's thumb, and Cooley was over here where he had a lot of freedom. And, uh, and, and Cooley was a magnificent technical surgeon. Nobody will ever be able to duplicate it. And uh, even uh, even looking back on it today, I was here and I can't believe he did the things that he could do technically. But uh, he went to visit Lillehi, and Lillehi did cross circulation, which was the first, the first successful open heart surgery was cross circulation. That is, 
congenital heart surgery where the parent served as the oxygenator because they, they couldn't make good oxygenators in those days. The first 26 patients after Gibbon, who did the first uh, successful open heart surgery, first 26 died, all died. And so it was a thought, and, and Gibbon never did another one after his first one, that uh, it was just something wrong with the heart and you, you couldn't correct it by heart surgery. And Cooley went up there and saw them doing this and came back, he made his own heart lung machine, which you can see up in the museum. It's, it's a, it was a coffee maker and uh, it was made drip coffee. His, his brother-in-law got it in a restaurant supply house and he put steel wool up here and bubbled oxygen through the blood, through a pump and had it come down here in the air. And that's what he started doing heart surgery with. And he had the best results in the world, mainly because he was so fast. Here, here it is in action. He did the first, uh, his first case was a post-infarct uh, VSD. Bad case to do today. And he plugged it with Ivalon sponge. I asked him one time what Ivalon sponge was and he said he forgot. But uh, it, it worked and the patient lived. And this was April of 1956. And by the end of the year, he'd done 95 cases. And his lived. And the reason they lived is because of this. He was so much faster than anybody else. He had all his cases and this time were timed with a stopwatch. The anesthesiologist kept a stopwatch. so. None of them ever went. The longest one I ever saw was 18 minutes, uh, and that was a tetralogy. So, and so he actually had people to live, and this was his, he reported this in, uh, uh, in 57, and the Mayo Clinic and the University of Minnesota at the same time had done 58 cases with 35 deaths. So if you needed a heart surgery, guess what? You've tried to get to Houston if you could, you know, because nobody came to Houston for the weather or the beach. They came here because Cooley was the best technical heart surgeon in the world. And Dr. DeVeghe didn't do a heart surgery until 1960. So Cooley had already been doing it for four years and he did it, he moved everything to St. Luke's after the first year or so. So that was, uh, as I said, mainly the reason we're here. When I was a medical student, we were all required to do a project and I, uh, I had no uh, interest in surgery, but I was a history English major and, and my, uh, but one of my co-fraternity brothers uh, at Texas was, a, was a, a medical student with me here as well, Frank Polk. And he wanted to be a heart surgeon. Everybody wanted to be a heart surgeon then because Dr. DeBakey was famous and Dr. Cooley was famous. And uh, I didn't pay much attention to it, but we had to do a research project and he signed me up. Uh, we, we had to have our title in by November the 1st when we were first year medical students. So we had a couple of months with he stopped me on October the 30th and asked me what I was going to do for my research. And I told him, I said, I don't know. I haven't given any thought yet, you know. Had another day. And he signed me up for, to work with Domingo Leota on the artificial heart. So that's how it got involved. And uh, he had a tremor and he quit doing surgery the next year and uh, surgery research, and I stayed with Leota. And uh, I've been working on it ever since. Then he, I remember Dr. DeVecchi telling me this, and, and it looked like he was probably right. It looked pretty simple, and it was simple to make a pump, just not one that would last and perform the way the natural heart does. And uh, so he was a little off on those. Heart transplantation interposed itself here and 
And uh, this first uh, episode of Heart Transplant started in December of 67 with uh, Chris Bernard and Dr. Cooley. Uh, they, uh, they did, uh, Dr. Cooley did more than anybody in the world, of course, in that first era. And here he is with, uh, you were supposed to have three visitors. You couldn't have more than three visitors in uh, St. Luke's ER, OR at that time. So Dr. Cooley didn't quite confirm to that. He's hidden in here somewhere. Anyway, he also did the first successful heart transplant in, uh, in the US, not, not the first one. Shumway did uh, two and Canavents did one, but they all both died in the hospital. All three died in the hospital. Cooley did one in April, and the luck of the Irish, the guy lived over a year. It was his longest live. And as you can see, Houston, between Dr. Cooley and Dr. DeVay, he did about 25% of all the world's heart transplants then. And, uh, but the, the problem was, uh, of course, they failed. Uh, had very poor immune suppression at the time. But one of the things that Dr. Cooley did Dr. Leota got uh, tired of working with Dr. DeVakey because Dr. DeVakey would never sew in a total heart. He came and sewed some in, which he didn't, he never reported when I was a medical student, but it, it took like two hours on the heart-lung machine. If you put a calf on a heart-lung machine, particularly at the bowl oxygen in those days, for two hours and did nothing, they would all die. So they all died, but the pump worked well, and Leota knew that, and he came to Cooley, and Cooley used it as a bridge to transplant, and it actually worked pretty well. The pump was uh, worked for 40, uh, actually 60-something hours, and, and it was a, a very valuable, at, at least potentially valuable, because he was able to transplant him. He was way over immune suppressed. So when he got his heart transplant, the, his white count was 2,000. So he died of overwhelming sepsis, which was the main cause. This is the Leota, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the oh, uh, what's the name of this building? The Japanese, Wada, Wada. Uh, valve. It was a Cooley water valve until it started popping out. Uh, they never tested it in animals and it started popping out after about six months. And uh, that's why the FDA is involved in all devices. Because prior to that, the FDA never had to approve. You could have a device and it never went to any testing. But when they realized that they'd never tested this valve in an animal or any, any way and, and it failed, they required, that's how they got involved. So that's the, but that was the valve that was used in the first total heart that Cooley implanted. And there was a patient, he actually woke up, was extubated, he, did, he looked great. They should have left him on the pump, but, they were just uh, afraid, and of course there was worldwide attention. They wanted to do the transplant as soon as possible, and they transplanted him too soon with he was over immune suppressed. This is his chest x-ray right after the surgery. None of the total hearts ever look that good today that we do. And the pump actually looked very good. They thought the pump was causing some hemolysis toward the end, but it was, uh, it was probably related to, to the long pump time because he was on the pump, the bubble oxygenator for over uh, two, uh, uh, two hours. It started this uh, fight between Dr. Cooley and Dr. DeBakey that was very well publicized in those days. And, uh, and of course, Dr. Cooley reported this, and you can see Dr. DeBakey, who did, he, he got all the, the research money for it, and but you don't see his name on this. Anyway, this was a very 
uh, spectacular event in surgery and medicine. They had this, this all over the world. People were talking about this. I was in Vietnam. Everybody said it was a safer place. I was in an assault helicopter company. We're doing combat assaults. I flew on all the combat assaults, 12 of them, when I was there. As I said, it was a safer place, I think. And uh, my daughter says I was in a little better shape then. So, you know, anyway. They, uh, they went on and on. This is interesting if you could hear it. Dr. DeVakey says Dr. Cooley was a good surgeon, but that's all. He had no interest in research. And he was right. Dr. Cooley had no interest in research. But the, he did show the feasibility of the artificial heart. And, this, the, and he wanted to get out of Baylor. Dr. Baker was very predictable, so he knew that if he, he purloined the heart, that Dr. Baker would fire him, which is what he wanted. He was trying to figure out a way to get out of Baylor. And, uh, and that worked perfectly for him. And so that's why the Texas Heart Institute became independent. Now, not what Dr. Cooley didn't exactly count on, he should have thought about it, because Dr. Bakey was predictable in these ways. He fired Leota, too, because Leota was involved with the pump. So then he had to have a lab. Well, he didn't know how to deal with that, and Dr. Cooley would never spend a nickel. <laughs> that was one of his two bit worst traits, was he was so tight. And, uh, but he got money from the Cullens. He knew some people on the Cullen Foundation. And the first lab was built right where we're sitting in this space. It was a tin lab. They made it with the uh, tin that they used in World War II. And uh, it eventually moved it over into the, to the main building. And Domingo Leota ran it for about two years. And then Jack Norman came in and was recruited. And, and it's interesting because if, if it wasn't for that, I'm sure these pumps that we use would have never been developed because if I were trying to develop them under DeBakey, that would have been impossible. Nobody believed in a continuous flow pump, and uh, certainly for long-term use. The heart transplants, as I said, failed in that first era. Nearly all of them were dead within the first year. And uh, so again, the, uh, and the cardiac transplants just stopped, except for Stanford, basically. So again, they went back to long-term mechanical pumps. And uh, again, this uh, was a, a big grant that they, they gave from the uh, NIH. And that resulted in the first uh, LVAD, postal LVAD to be approved, which we developed all these LVADs here because uh, Jack Norman left the lab in uh, the 70s, and I, I took it over in 79, actually. And, and uh, the first 22 patients we put LVADs in all died. But also the first 31 patients we put balloon pumps in all died. So if we had had an FDA then, we would never even have had the balloon pump today, I'm sure. Anyway, the, uh, we finally got patients discharged on LVAD, uh, transcutaneously powered, uh, or percutaneously powered. This is the first patient that I, that I did in 91. And uh, he was discharged from the hospital, so. And, and these were the first pumps to be implanted. Now, I don't, I don't want to belabor the postal pumps won't work long, more than about two years at most. We did get one last four years, but that's very rare because they can't take that flexing. So that was one of the reasons I started to working on these continuous flow pumps. And uh, the uh, you obviously can't have a, the, the problem of durability, but they were also big, pumps, you know, they would 
They had size limitations as well, and Shumway always said that they had no real epidemiologic significance because they were only bridges to transplants, although they could survive, they saved many patients, they couldn't really be a long-term pump. And the question came with whether we needed a pump, a pulse or not, and the general thought was that you had to have a pulse, that's, that's the normal physiology. And uh, on these postal pumps, I will say, the NIH spent over a billion dollars on, on the postal pump development, and they didn't spend a nickel on the continuous flow, which has, has come to plague us uh, to this day. But uh, there were five different centers utilizing postal pumps, and uh, there's been none other than ourselves that worked on the continuous flow. But we did have to develop a small, a smaller pump, and I knew the only organ that really needed a pulse was the heart. If you were replacing the heart, then that became its moot, becomes moot. And uh, Jarvik did, made a great contribution to these implantable pumps by developing the first and only non-lubricated bearing in, in the world is the one that we use in these implantable pumps today. And uh, the hemo pump, which Rich Wampler did, uh, settled uh, the high RPM question uh, that you could have RPMs above 25,000 without causing hemolysis. So these are the reasons we, we got into continuous flow pumps, the Hemo pump and the Jarvik. And there have been nearly 100,000 of these pumps implanted worldwide now. And those are the two technologies that were developed in our lab and first implanted here uh, at, and are the basis of all of this. These are the bearings. You see the little red things. You have to have bearings if you go from something that's moving to something that's not moving. That's why you have to have oil in your car. Okay. And again, that was why the engineers all said that you can't have a non-lubricated bearing in the bloodstream. It just won't work. Well, Jarvik and I did about 60 animals and we worked on it a little over five years in our lab down there in the basement before he figured out a way to do it. And uh, he deserves a lot of credit for that. And the HeartMate II was an offshoot of the Hemo pump. And uh, it's the most widely used pump today as, as a bridge to transplant. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure it's the best pump, but the company was the best run company. And so mm -hmm. that was, why it was so widely used. Probably uh, both the Jarvik and the hardware have uh, advantages over it, but they weren't run. If you have a product, you have to have a company that can, can manufacture the pump and, 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 uh, and sell it. This is a guy that went five years on a HeartMate II. Here he is out playing tennis. He didn't want a transplant because he was a smart guy. He was an engineer. We put the pump in when he was 26, and he knew he wasn't going to. He probably wouldn't see 40 with a heart transplant. The 10-year survival is only about 50 percent. 15 is about 15 percent. So he wanted me to remove it, and he was doing everything he wanted to do. He got married. He had a couple of kids with that pump. And uh, he's, uh, we took the pump out after five years and he's like eight years now after removal of the pump, which most of these young patients with idiopathic cardiomyopathies will heal if the, just by resting the heart. There's been over uh, a thousand of these pumps implanted over 10 years. And uh, we've had patients over 15, years with one pump, totally uh, well, and so that the pumps don't wear out, which was the first uh, goal, uh, is, is to have a pump that uh, was smaller, of course, and that was more durable. 
And the failures of the pump are always related to the management of the patients. They're all mismanaged uh, in my mind. Uh, every time I make rounds, I, I, I see patients here that, you know, I, I think uh, I would manage differently. But anyway, anatomically, they're put in, they're tricky to put in. If you have the inflow canyon against the septum or against the mitral, then you get turbulence and then you get hypercoagulability, and that's why you have thrombosis, but not the pump. The, the durability of these pumps, we haven't seen a failure mode yet. And certainly 20 years is probably uh, easy to, to reach one that's properly implanted. Now the future, the two things I just want to talk to, one I always hate to talk to the cardiologist about, because this is a pump we've been working on since 2005, this little pump uh, to be implanted through the subclavian vein. I got this idea because Clarence Dennis, who was one of the worst, uh, one of the, he wasn't worse, he, was, he, he did a lot of crazy things. But one of them was he implanted a pump to the internal jugular vein, this is 1958, and he went down to the frameal valve and he cut a hole in the frameal valve and put the pump in. The only place the two atria are joined is the frameal valve. And he put it in eight patients and in seven of them, he was able to put the pump into the left atrium, bring the blood out, put it in the femoral artery and, and support the patient. And one he missed and the heart ruptured, of course. But uh, this was 1958. So he showed the feasibility of it. They're all nearly dead when he put them in, uh, so they didn't survive. But the pump worked, and it became obvious to me as the cardiologists were able to put all these long term wires into the jugular vein, we could put a small pump in through the jugular vein and, and uh, put it into the left atrium just like uh, uh, Dennis did. And uh, we're working on this. We don't want to have uh, bearings in it. And you don't have to have bearings. You can magnetically suspend these things. And we're, we've got an NIH grant right now working on it up on the uh, ninth floor. It was just very uh, clever uh, Dr. Wang who is, uh, I'm sure in the next two years, will have this ready to implant in patients. Billy's done some, uh, implanted it in temporarily uh, in, in some animals that we were gonna sacrifice, because we, did, we didn't, had no funding for this either. But we, now we have an NIH grant, uh, R01 grant to study this. So I think this will be something that I'm sure in the professional lifetime of most of you in here, the cardiologists will be able to implant this through the subclavian vein. And uh, it, it should go into the left atrium. That shouldn't be a, a problem. And uh, it, it's uh, be a lot easier than doing it blind as Clarence Dennis did. Uh, so, this, uh, I think, will be implantable. I hope within the next two years we'll have this ready for patients. Since we don't open the chest, it'll be a lot easier, of course, to get through the FDA. And it'll, you can make a, a lot better argument for a class three cardiac, you know, someone, so, since you don't have to open the chest, I think we we'll use about a four millimeter uh, graft to come through that and unload into the uh, subclavian artery, which again, the first LVAD that was successfully employed was when I was a medical student with Dr. DeVakey and it went from the left atrium to the right uh, 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 axillary artery, actually, subclavian. And this this should work 
and I think it uh, can be easily powered. I, I think without any, uh, I'm, I'm confident it can be powered transcutaneously without even breaking the skin. But even if you have to break the skin, there'll just be a, a small uh, incision. And, and uh, but I, I, uh, as I said, I hope we'll see this in patients within the next two, two years. Now, the total heart replacement we've been working on as an idea for continuous flow pumps for years. Uh, the first thing, it's different because it's a totally different physiology. The LVADs are a different physiology, but once you totally replace the heart with a continuous flow pump, it's you really made a big jump. And uh, it does, this is one of the advantages. You know, the, the left and right ventricle don't pump the same amount of blood. I used to ask cardiologists this, but they never knew the answer. But, because uh, it, it, technically it doesn't matter that much because the left side gets the bronchial circulation directly through the pulmonary vein. So with each uh, uh, contraction, it's about one cc more on the left than the right, which doesn't matter. But once we started making totally implantable artificial hearts, it really mattered. Because 100,000 beats every 24 hours, then you're 100,000 cc's out of sync if you don't uh, adjust for that. And that's the beautiful thing about continuous flow pumps is they have an automaticity to adjust to increased inflow pressure without uh, doing anything. Whereas with the postal pump, with the Abicor, we had to go through all sorts of gyrations to get that to work. And I'm not sure how long it would have worked. <coughs> but, uh, and, it, and it was very challenging. Now, uh, I guess, we, uh, I don't know about these out of order, but we put, uh, Billy and I put this in a patient in 2011, uh, two continuous uh, flow pumps. And uh, actually, the patient did well. This isn't the patient, this is a calf. <laughs> and we, this is the first animal we did. We did uh, with two Jarvik's, and you can see there's no pulsatility involved, and we reported that. This is the first animal. And this was uh, in <coughs> uh, this was in 2004, 2005, and uh, it it was the first uh, demonstration of, of continuous flow pump. And this actually was the patient that we uh, put the pump in, and it worked beautifully. He was uh, intubated, and he was dying uh, as an engineer, and he. We got permission from the family to try this, and here he was uh, about a month afterwards. He was back working on his computers, and he was doing beautifully, but unfortunately he had an amyloid, and it turned out it was, we thought it was just going to be in the heart, and we could do a heart transplant, but he had it in the liver and the lungs and the kidney, and he uh, uh, cut himself off, actually. Now, Daniel Timms, who's here today, had been working on a continuous flow total heart for a number of years in uh, Australia, and he brought this to us in 2011. You can see this has, only has one moving part, this center thing here. This is a better demonstration uh, of it, as uh, it, it is, hmm. Oh, yeah, there it is. So this is a smaller pump than the, the old Abbey Core. It's about half the size. It only has one moving part, and it's not touching anything. It's magnetically suspended, and it supplies both the pulmonary and the, the uh, systemic circulation. The systemic circulation comes off the, uh, the bottom of it, and uh, the uh, pulmonary on the top, and it's it's very uh, uh, 
sensitive, just like continuous flow pumps are. It has its in, in, inherent Starling's mechanism. Uh, it is uh, the uh, you know a, a very clever technology. I mean, we're doing the final FDA trials for this now. Now. We can, we can make this look like a pulse with this, which may be of some psychological value for the cardiologist and the nurses anyway, not having to look at just a straight line. I'm not sure physiologically it makes that much difference, but it does, we can do that, uh, and it, it's rather easily integrated into this, uh, into this technology. You know, the problem with Dr. Vakey in 1964, 65, thinking by 1980, we'd have it in 100,000 uh, patients. The technology just wasn't there then. <coughs> and, uh, and so there's been a lot of technological advances with this magnetic suspension. And this thing centers itself, Daniel tells me, it, it has information 20,000 times a second. So I don't believe that, but I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe the cell phones work either, but I still use them. This is an animal with total heart replacement with one of these pumps. And at rest, it has a pump, and it's about 11 on the left and 13 on the, on the right. It has a slight left or right shunt. Uh, and but you start the animal working walking without any change in the RPM, no change in the RPM. And you can see the right side now is up to 15, the left is up to 14. That's that's an automatic Starling response, and it works just the way we thought it would work. This is, a, of course, the size difference compared to the Abbey core. And uh, you could hear Dr. DeVake, he, he would say, I'm convinced we will have an artificial heart in, in our lifetime. Well, it wasn't in his, and it may not be in mine, but I think all of you will see one, you know, if we don't blow ourselves up. Uh, uh, in the in the next four to five years, it'll be uh, I think a valuable uh, adjunct to the treatment of heart failure patients. I remember talking to this uh, Irishman, this singer one time, and uh, he was a very interesting guy. And uh, he uh, I actually didn't know much about him. I had to call my daughter and find out who he was. And I, we were having dinner, and but uh, he was interested in how you know I came upon what I did, and I said, you know, I just did it, and uh, and he said that he was the same way with his uh, with his music because he writes all the music, you know, he didn't copy the music they wrote it, and and he said, uh, and and one of the problems with being creative is you can't be creative looking back. And I think that's one of the problems, even with our educational system, we test people on things looking back, but we don't, uh, don't crest, test them on creativity. And I think one of the things that helped me a lot in my history uh, exposure and is uh, I already, a member Jonathan Swift said in 2011 that if uh, you have a, a good idea and and uh, or he said a person with a good idea you can always tell they've got a good idea because they'll be surrounded by a confederacy of dunces telling them they couldn't it can't be done so if you have an idea and all your friends say, well, that's a great idea, that's really gonna help, it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> but if they all tell you, just like they all told me you couldn't possibly have a non-postal pump that would last, uh, you know, I knew that 
Jonathan Swift, you know, to me that was a good sign. It, maybe it would work. Anyway, I'd be glad to take any questions.